Hey, what's up, guys? This is going to be a review of Bret the Hitman Hearts, the Dungeon Collection. This is a set of all never-before-released uh, Bret Hart matches from the archives, uh, chosen by Bret himself. So, you know, apparently Bret worked very hard um, on this set, really wanted to release. You know, a, a lot of his best matches have been released already, as you guys know. But uh, in this set, th these are matches that are important to him for personal reasons. I wouldn't expect a whole bunch of five-star matches here. These are just, you know, special matches that, you know, each and every match had something to do with him, you know, propelling his career to that next level. And uh, at the same time, I think he wanted to, um, you know, I, I think he wanted to, you know, help the people out that... Um, wrestled him in some of these matches just to make sure that they're remembered for their legacies so um a really really classy set i would say um you know i would say more so than anybody brett has been one of the guys that you know if you guys remember the quote when, when brett was going through his uh, negotiations with wcw he, he always said that uh you know he's not greedy for money but he's greedy for respect and uh i, I think it's true I, I think more so than anybody brett is really that one guy that wants to be remembered he wants his you know he wants to be respected he wants his history and his uh anthology to be um you know c kind of uh held in high regard you know I, I i think a guy like brett hart probably cares more about his you know match history than a guy like bill goldberg so uh i'm just really happy for brett i'm, I'm happy that he's on good terms with the wwe uh it seems like the survivor series screw job bullshit is uh, you know, behind everybody now. They didn't, they didn't even mention the, mention it once on the whole uh, DVD set. So, um, yeah, just a really great project here. I re really had fun listening to Bret Hart's, uh, you know, sound bites and interviews bef each, before each and every match. So, you know, you get everything on here from the Stampede stuff all the way down to the uh, WCW stuff. So just more, um, you know, archived, you know, unreleased Bret Hart footage here for all the Bret Hart fans. So it's definitely a must-have if you're a Bret Hart fan. Um, so here we go. We have Bret Hart versus the Dynamite Kid. Now, a lot of the stuff from Stampede, uh, I'm not going to rate because it was either too short or it was clipped. Uh, the Bret Hart Dynamite Kid match, the two out of three falls match, I think this went 60 minutes. They only showed the last 10 minutes of it for I, I don't know why. I know Bret wanted to release a whole Stampede um, DVD of all his matches, but for some reason that I guess they couldn't get that done. Uh, Brett actually went to, to uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling around the WCW area, where he took on Buzz Sawyer. Uh, yeah, Buzz Sawyer was kind of like a legend around the Atlanta area, so that that was kind of like really before WCW came into fruition around that time. Uh, also, you have um, you know Bret Hart versus Leo Burke from Stampede Wrestling. That was very very short. Um, so I'm only going to rate the WWF stuff and the WCW stuff. So the first WWF match was uh, Bret Hart versus the Dynamite Kid uh, from September of 1985. Now, the thing about the Dynamite Kid is, obviously, this is the guy that Chris Benoit uh, emulated. Um, you know, he, he, I think Benoit actually knocked on his door and just said to him, Hey, man, I want to be exactly like you. And, and it's just kind of freaky, man, because you, you could just tell Benoit really... He really adapted and really, you know, just took everything from the Dynamite Kid, and uh, really, it's just it, you. It's just kind of scary how they're not related, because you know Benoit got everything the Dynamite Kid does down to a T, because they just they just look so similar in the ring. And uh, Brett even said, you know, before the match that, he, in his opinion, even though he was the one that said he's the best there is, the best there was, the best there will be, uh, you know, Brett really believes that Dynamite Kid was, you know, the, the greatest of all time. He said uh, that the wrestling became great because the Dynamite Kid paved the way for everybody to be as athletic and innovative as everyone eventually got. So uh pays huge respect to the Dynamite Kid. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the Bret Hart Dynamite Kid match, classic stuff from the 80s right there, three and a half stars. Really enjoyed it. Good stuff there. Um, next up, we have the first uh, Hart Foundation match. We have the Hart Foundation versus the Islanders. This is from uh, the Philadelphia Spectrum in March of 1987. Um, you know, th I would say that the uh, you know the golden era of tag team wrestling. You know, from what I've saw, I would say it's probably the late 80s in the WWF. You just had so many great tag teams: Hart Foundation, Demolition, the Rockers, and even the even the Islanders. Man, this was. Um, you know, Brett liked this match because, you know, he felt like the Philadelphia Spectrum had, you know, some of the rowdiest fans, some of the most vocal and, you know, some of the, um, you know, just kind of, um, you know, I guess rowdy would be a good word, way to put it. Just um, this match just had a lot of emotion, very, it was kind of a slugfest and, um, you know, just a, a nice little old school tag match there between the Hart Foundation and the Islanders. Uh, next up, we had uh, Brett Hart versus the Andre the 
giant. This was from Milan, Italy. I think Brett actually walked off a flight. He was really tired, really cranky, and then he looked at the uh, the match listing in the locker room and it said Brett Harford's Andre the Giant, and he was like stunned. So uh, you know, it's, it's what you get. It's like your typical Andre the Giant match. Obviously, you can't really expect much from Andre at that point in his career, but um, you know, probably the weakest match on the set. But you know, it is what it is. Uh, from there, we have Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect. This is from Maple Leaf Gardens in uh, April of 1989. Uh, so, so a lot, as a lot of you guys know, Brett has said on countless occasions that uh, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, is uh, his favorite oppon opponent of all time. Brett even said if he could wrestle one more match, he would pick uh, Mr. Perfect as uh, his opponent. He, he just loved wrestling him that much. And the funny thing is, Brett, he, Brett actually said that the first match was terrible because they were trying too hard to please each other and they were being overly, you know, um, generous and overly nice to each other and it just didn't work but uh they stuck to the formula and the, for the second match everything kind of clicked and uh for this match right here this is the first time they really he really felt like they clicked together and kind of you know set the tone for some of the great matches they would have in the future like the SummerSlam match and the king of the ring match and so um yeah brett and perfect in this match it actually went to a uh, 20 minute time limit uh brett asked for five more minutes and it ended in kind of a brawl uh, you know, it, it was kind of similar to their other matches with, you know, Perfect, you know, being the aggressor and, and Brett being the great babyface and, you know, Perfect kind of overselling a lot of Brett's offense. So, you know, just good stuff from both guys. It didn't really blow me away. But um, I have to say with a lot of these matches, just kind of be prepared for a lot of, you know, time limit draws, a lot of count outs and a lot of disqualifications. It kind of sucks. But, you know, that's just the way it was back in the 80s and 90s. You know, just a lot of that stuff going on. But. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, the next match, we have the Hart Foundation versus Akeem and Big Boss Man, the Twin Towers. Uh, this match was special to Brett because Brett thought he, um, he might have ended his career at the time. I think he was going for a sunset flip, and Akeem, uh, formerly the, um, what was his name? Um, fuck, what was his name? was a one-man gang. I'm sorry. Yeah, Akeem used to be known as the one-man gang. He actually, yeah, Brett was going for a sunset flip, and, uh, you know, Akeem actually just sat on his sternum, 400 pounds. He thought he might have, you know, crushed his sternum. Yeah, uh, You know, he thought maybe he could have been out for a really, really long time. So, you know, it was it was kind of a blessing for Brett to get through the match. But, um, yeah, man, just a good old-school tag match. You know, they got the hot tag to Jim DeAnvil Nightheart. You know, Boss Man. Actually, Boss Man was only 24 years old at, at this time, so he started out really, really young. Uh, this, this is when Slick was the manager. Once again, ended in a DQ. There was a huge beatdown on Slick. So it, it was still fun stuff. Fun little tag match there. Uh, next up, from the greatest supercard of all time, as they call it, from the Tokyo Dome, April of 1990, we have Bret Hart versus Tiger Mask 2. Uh, Tiger, ha Tiger Mask 2 is actually uh, Mishihawa Misawa. Misawa. Uh, for those that don't know, um, it, this is before Masao really broke through. I, I think he was kind of holding back with the Tiger Mask gimmick. Uh, Brett was kind of a heel in this match, um, you know, in in Japan. He, um, you know, was kind of playing possum and then kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, it just surprised uh, Tiger Mask with some of his offense. And, you know, some of the crowd, you know, felt he was kind of disrespectful by doing that. Uh, I, I was kind of, I really didn't know how Bret Hart's style would work in Japan, but, you know, after, I watched this match twice, and I have to say, it, wor it worked fairly well, considering Bret is really not, you know, that stiff of a wrestler, even though he looks pretty stiff when he throws punches, but, um, you know, not the Misawa you would expect, uh, you could definitely tell he kind of limited his style as the Tiger Mask, you know, under the Tiger Mask gimmick, but, uh, you know, still really, really good stuff, you know, I, I, I thought this was uh, kind of sweet, Bret actually said that, um, he didn't really like working in Japan because a lot of the wrestlers, you know, they took advantage of him because they, they actually like to be a little stiff, stiffer than he usually likes to be. So he didn't really like that about Japan. But, um, yeah, the mask against him and Tiger Mask, I'll give it about three and a quarter. Uh, next up, we have Bret Hart versus Ric Flair from uh, an Intercontinental Championship match from 1991. This is when Flair you know was the real world's champion with the WCW belt and when he just arrived into the company. Um, you know, Brett actually said that he respected Flair only because, you know, a lot of the guys that he respected, you know, were saying all these great things about Flair. Um, now, I, I remember back, you know, when Brett used to write that column on his website, he used, he used to say that, um, obviously he didn't talk about this on the set because it would have been very disrespectful to Flair. But um, 
he, he yeah, well, he did say that that Flair kind of you know didn't really have a lot of psychology. Kind of did, you know, the same things over and over again. He did say that on the DVD, but you know what he said in his column, I think back in two thousand three, he said that you know when when him and Flair were when Flair wrote his book, and they were going through, um, you know, their little feud. Yeah, if you guys remember, Flair, Flair thought that uh, Brett tried to gain sympathy because of his brother brother Owen's death, and that started a big controversy. And, and he thought that Brett was like the fan of his, you know, he was he was the uh, president of his own fan club. He thought he was better than what he really was. But uh, but but Brett, um, he, he he said you know he, he said that his father told him one time that uh, you know Stu Stu Hart always thought that Flair was a routine guy. Which meant that he was you know, basically have the same match over and over again, never switch things up, and just do the same routine and the same routine. So, you know, that, that's that's the fucked up thing about Bret Hart and Ric Flair. It, it's kind of like the best technical wrestler versus the the wrestler that everyone else thinks is the greatest of all time. It's kind of a, you know, it, it's it's a, it's a little it's a nice mix, but uh, I don't know. The, the mix didn't always work too well. I know both of them were really didn't really care for the match when uh, Bret Hart did win the belt from Ric Flair in 1992, but um. Yeah, I, I remember Bret Hart. I mean, uh, Chris Benoit. He actually said, you know, if everyone wrestled like Bret Hart and if everyone wrestled like Ric Flair, then you know everything would be boring. But uh, you know, this match right here. I mean, what can you really say about it? You know, I, I, I don't think Flair and Bret had the best chemistry. Obviously, you have two different people with two different, you know, you know styles. But uh, you know, still good stuff. Some good near falls. Some you know, F Flair being the dirtiest player in the game. You know, Bret Hart. I know Bret always hated uh, Flair's chops. You know, just the way Bret sold them. You could just tell he just couldn't stand them. So, you know, uh, good stuff. But once again, I, I just really didn't care for the finish. But you know, let's just move on to the next match. We have Bret Hart versus The Undertaker. Uh, he said he he really wasn't that. Um, didn't really buy into Taker's gimmick with all the hocus pocus stuff. That was his actual quote, but uh, eventually he did, you know, Undertaker became one of his favorite guys to work with, you know, during like 1997 and all that stuff. But uh, at first he felt like Taker needed a lot of work and, and, and Brett felt, felt like he was one of the guys who really brought the best out of Taker. And Taker was so relieved to work with Brett because he finally said, you know, I said to him, I'm so glad I get the chance to work with you because now we can finally show everybody that I can wrestle and I'm not just some type of, you know, Frankenstein gimmick. But, uh, yeah, you know, I remember at that time, uh, Taker really didn't do much. You know, I, I think the gimmick really called for him to do more, you know, choke holds and, you know, just, you know, slowing the pace down. Really didn't really get to show what he could do a lot of times. But this match with Brett, it was very, very fluid and, uh, you know, it's nice, short and sweet. You know, I, I know a lot of people think their other matches from 97 were very methodical. Actually, my brother hates their match from, uh, my brother hates the match that from, uh, What's it called? Uh, one night only in in, uh, in the UK. He just thought that match was very methodical, very slow. He actually, you know, he always falls asleep to that match, so he doesn't like that. So some people have mixed feelings on their other matches, but you know, this match is a little bit more easier to digest if you thought some of their other matches were a little bit too methodical. So uh, so after that, uh, Brett actually said his favorite big man to work with, or the best big man, was uh, Bam Bam Bigelow. You know, we've seen Brett wrestle Bam Bam several times. I think on the uh, the other set they put a match from Spain on there. And Brett actually defeated uh, Bam Bam Bigelow in the finals of the King of the Ring. So, um, yeah, I would say this is one of the better matches from the set. You know, Brett and Bam Bam just have great chemistry. Um, you know, but the great thing about Bam Bam is just he, he could fly, man. He could just do a lot of, for his size. He could just, he can move. He can move really, really well. Um, yeah, he goes for a lot of high-risk maneuvers, and the combination just worked. You know, I, I think Brett really does work well with bigger guys. He just tells really, really good stories, you know, chopping them down, you know, just bringing them down, but going to work on the leg and, you know, outmaneuvering them from whatever position. He just finds a way to make it interesting with all big guys, and obviously he was going to work with Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, basically, the, the same finish here, they, they, every single time I see a Bret Hart-Bam Bam Bigelow match, it seems like they always did the same finish with, you know, uh, Brett on the top of his shoulders and just rolling him up for the pin. Uh, same finish. You know, I, I think that was a finish to their King of the Ring match as well. So, all right. Next up, we move on to the the disc two of the Blu-ray set. We have um, Bret Hart versus Diesel from the King of the Ring of 1994. This is uh, when Bret Hart was the WWF champion and Diesel was the Intercontinental champion. Uh, Shawn Michaels is at ringside. Jim DeAnvil Nightheart was at ringside. So there was a lot of crap going on, which I didn't really care for, but. I'll tell you, man, I, I think Bret Hart and Diesel work very well together. If you look at Diesel's, like, top ten matches of his career, it's probably all filled with, you know, all Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels matches. But, uh, 
You know, the interesting thing about this match, this this was really Diesel's first, you know, big money match uh, since being in the WWF. So he's really nervous, really wanted to put on a good showing. So Brett worked extremely hard to, you know, make him look good. And I just think the combination of Brett and Diesel worked because, you know, Brett, you know, even though he is athletic, he does, you know, slow it down. He's a bit more methodical and, you know, he tells great stories with big men. So I think that's why it really worked. I don't think he saw anyone trying to rush, you know, Diesel into anything. It just really worked very well. Um, they had a great trilogy. This King of the Ring match is very sweet. I'll give it about three and three quarter stars. Um, I, I, th I thought it was just as good as the Royal, Bum R Royal Rumble match and then the Survivor Series match. I think the Survivor Series match is by far their best match ever, you know, probably because Brett won the belt. But, um, just that whole match is just one of the greatest matches in Survivor Series history. So, you know, Diesel and Bret Hart, they had a nice little trilogy. So you could definitely make an argument that, uh, you know, Diesel's best opponent was Bret Hart, um, without a doubt. So next up we have Bret Hart versus Owen Hart. This was from uh, Stockton, California. It was a nice short 10-minute no holds bar match, really fast, really exciting. But, you know, he did talk about Owen Hart and the, um, you know, the WrestleMania 10 buildup. Before the match... Um, Owen was going to do all these high risk maneuvers and, and, and Brett, before the match, Brett was like kind of worried. He was like, you know what? We got to change everything. This is going to make you feel like this is going to make you out to be a baby face and they're going to, they're going to boo me because I'm the older brother. So the fans are going to turn on me. So you got to be more of a heel. So they basically switched around everything right before WrestleMania 10. And then they had more of a storytelling kind of matches. You guys might remember at WrestleMania 10. So, um, that was good stuff. You know, the, the, and th that's the funny thing. I think a lot of people, did really root for Owen, <laughs> and um, I, th I think Brett took offense to anyone in the crowd that was gonna, you know, cheer against him. If if you guys watch the WrestleMania 10 match, there's actually a guy in the crowd that's like, there's just one guy. He's like, come on, Owen, and then Brett just looks at him like, I can't believe, I can't believe you're rooting for my brother. He actually he looked like Brett was actually taking it personal. Like it just shows you that's how serious Bret Hart takes his craft. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, the match between him and Owen, uh, the match in here was only 10 minutes. It's a no holds bar match, really, really fast, really exciting. Uh, a great television match right there. Uh, next up, we have uh, Bret Hart versus Jean-Pierre Lafitte. Uh, Jean-Pierre Lafitte is actually from um, Montreal, Quebec. He's a French-Canadian wrestler. And um, he kind of had like this pirate gimmick. He actually stole Bret Hart's jacket. Bret actually said this was like the lamest storyline he was involved in. But uh, he's good though. He's kind of out of shape, a lot of body fat. Kind of, you know, uh, I would kind of kind of reminds me a little bit of like how Michael Elgin used to look like, to, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, a little sloppy. But the, the guy he works extremely hard. He's he's, he's in pretty good shape for the, the way he looks. And this was just. Um, you know, a very hard fought match, you know, Brett just doing anything he could and, you know, Jean-Pierre Lafitte, you know, never giving up and a lot of suicidal offense, just a lot of stiff, rugged action. It wasn't pretty, but, uh, you know, a lot of exciting near falls and, uh, you know, Brett really had to work for this victory right here. This is one of the hidden gems from the In Your House uh, pay-per-view history. Uh, I would say that Brett is probably the MVP of the uh, the in your house pay per views. I mean, especially in '95 when when Diesel was the champion, Bret Hart was the guy that was kind of carrying the pay per views with all these uh, you know awesome show stealing matches. He had a great match with Hakushi um, in your house, and uh, you know, I'm sure he had some other great matches from the in your house pay per views as well as, as you guys know. So um, from there we have Bret Hart versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. This was from Sun City Super Bowl in uh, South Africa. In September of 1996, so Austin's fresh off of his King of the Ring speech. Uh, Brett lost to Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 12, so he, he took some time off to film a uh, television series in South Africa. I, I guess it really wasn't too successful because you know Brett did want to, you know, take some time away from wrestling and step off into you know becoming an actor, but it, it didn't work out for him. So, but Brett did say, you know, if, if you guys come to South Africa, I will wrestle for the uh, WWF. So. Stone Cold Steve Austin was making all these challenges to Bret Hart, so they had their finally had their match. Now th this is a great example of uh, now this is the first impressions that I had of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like I, I never really, you know, to me when I remember Austin, you know, b before you know the Attitude Era, he was more of you know the Ted DiBiase, the ringmaster, the technician, the uh, you know he he was more of a technician. You know, he was more of that heel technician. I think even Shawn Michaels said like that. That's what he remembers Steve Austin as. You know that the. the you know, the, the ruthless, you know, you know, technician. Um, so him, him and Brett right here, uh, it, it was a good match. It was, um, 
I would say this was good. You know, the South African crowd was, you know, really hot for Brett. As you guys know, Brett was really popular overseas, you know, more so than some of the other wrestlers. So, um, you know, Austin got some good heat. You know, it's um, it, this is more scientific, I would say, than a lot of their other matches. You know, don't expect the intensity and the brawling of the WrestleMania 13 match, but, you know, just good, solid wrestling, nice old school storytelling here. Um, you know, pretty sweet ending with the uh, small package. So uh, really, really good stuff between uh, Brett and Austin, but definitely, you know, definitely not up to par with some of their other stuff, but it's just a nice, good feel-out match. Uh, next up, we have uh, Bret Hart versus the Patriot. Uh, Bret, Bret said that during the summer of 1997 was his uh, favorite time, um, you know, being a, a heel in the United States and being a babyface in Canada, being the Canadian hero with, you know, the Hart Foundation, Brian Pillman, British Bulldog, Owen Hart, uh, David Boy Smith. He just loved that time. And, you know, I would say a lot of people would say that 1997, as far as, you know, Raw goes, probably the most exciting time to be a pro wrestling fan. And a lot of it had to do with Bret Hart. And if I was to change my MVP from... Uh, 1997. I know I gave it to Stone Cold Steve Austin when I did my video, but you know, if, if I were the, you know, I might have to change it to Brett. You know, it's it's so tough to say Austin or Brett in 1997. Who was the WWF's most valuable guy? It was probably Bret Hart. I mean, the, just the variety and just the uh, versatility that he had to be a, a heel and a face at the same time, depending on the location. It just, it was just, uh, it's never it's something that's really never been done before. So. Um, you know, Bret Hart versus the Patriot. The, the, the thing about the Patriot that I really couldn't stand it, they, he actually has Kurt Angle's theme music, so it kind of sucks for Angle. Like, they just gave him this theme that from this other, other gimmick that just didn't work out. So it's kind of, I can see why Angle kind of felt disrespected that, you know, the WWF didn't really give him his own theme song. So, but I don't know. Whenever I hear that song, you still think of Kurt Angle. It's still a great theme song. But I don't know. The Patriot, man, the, I, I thought the gimmick kind of sucked. Uh, I thought the wrestler, he looked like he was kind of on steroids. He really didn't really move that well, not that fluid. Brett had to really bust his ass in this match. I thought Brett was great. He was just a white hot heel. Just everything he did, you know. Uh, and I would say that, you know, the fans really didn't buy into the Patriot gimmick. You could de just definitely tell, like, times were definitely changing. You know, there's just no way, even though Brett was so hated and even though he was so pro Canada, there's just no way that, that the fans are really going to get behind, you know, this, this American, you know, patriotic baby face. So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe the, this whole Patriot thing was kind of, you know, it, it was a great way to let WWF know that, you know, Kurt Angle just really wasn't going to work as a babyface right from the get-go. So you got to make Kurt Angle a heel when he debuted. So, uh, yeah, I, I did enjoy the match, though, because I thought Brett, you know, this is one of the best carry jobs I've ever seen. Some people say Brett's best match and his best carry job was uh, the Davy Boy Smith match from SummerSlam 1992. But... Yeah, uh, Davy Boy is a great wrestler, though. I would say this is probably his best carry job because you know I just w really wasn't that impressed with the Patriot. All right, so from there we have uh, WCW. You know, I, I have mixed feelings on when Bret went to WCW. Obviously, I always more so than anyone. I, you know, Bret Hart always seemed like a WWF guy. Like he really, and and he really tried to. Um, he was always very proud of his WWF colors, and he, even before the stuff of Vince McMahon, you could definitely tell he looked up to Vince as like a father figure. So I think the last thing Brett ever wanted to do was just leave. Um, but the problem was, I think he had, you know, guys like Shawn Michaels and other people that were, you know, against him, you know, making all that money. You know, that, you know Vince had just signed him to like a 20-year contract. So, um, you know, I, I just don't think Brett ever really wanted to leave. He, he Even he had a lot of, you know, he, he didn't want to go to WCW. He was very hesitant about it. He didn't think they would use him right. And uh, it's, it's exactly what happened. I just feel like Brett was out of place in WCW. It just didn't feel right. And uh, he, had, he said uh, about Booker T, he had this match with Booker T, he thought Booker T had a lot of potential, very, very athletic, was a guy he, could, he said he could, felt ele he could help elevate and take him to that next level, make a lot of money with him. But he said WCW doesn't think that way, so they dropped the ball with it. And this match, it kind of had a crappy finish. You know, it had, Booker T looked great, the match definitely had potential, but just a, a screwy WCW finish. If this is one of the Brett's best matches in WCW, and that's pretty sad because I just wasn't there. Just wasn't a lot here. Uh, and then, next up, we have the Sting match. Uh, Brett actually had a, a program with Sting. He thought uh, he was very, very. Um, he misjudged Sting. He thought Sting was going to be a pain in the ass to work with because, as you guys might remember, Sting and the Ultimate Warrior used to work out together, and I think they broke in together. So he was worried about that, about you know Sting's ego. But he he really he was wrong because he thinks Sting is one of the nicest guys. 
um, he's ever you know met in, in pro wrestling, and just a really really nice and, and, and generous guy. And uh, I agree, you know, j just from the outside looking in, I, I think Sting looks. He just seems like a really really cool guy, even though I'm not really a big Sting fan for, uh, of his in ring work. But um, definitely, th this this match was cool. Didn't really feel like a WCW match because they were in Canada, so the fans were really hot for Brett. I uh, really wasn't a big fan of Lex Luger interference. The, that just seemed very, very wacky and out of place. But uh, Brett surprisingly actually made Sting tap to the sharpshooter. So good finish, you know, uh, solid stuff. But you know, still three stars. Just not, nothing special. Still kind of a, you know, still kind of had that WCW booking style. So really didn't care for it. So uh, let's just talk about the uh, Blu-ray extras really quickly, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. Uh, just, they show a Bret Hart versus Yokozuna match. Brett was really disappointed with the uh, WrestleMania 9 match because Yoko actually rushed into the finish. So that's why he was kind of, you know, he just thought that was a terrible experience for him. Just because, not just because Hogan took the belt from him, but because of, uh, he just felt like Yoko kind of, you know, dropped the ball in the match. But, you know, the, the match with him and uh, Yoko here from, uh, what was it, Raw of 1993? Pretty solid stuff right there, you know. Just, just I thought Brett and Yoko actually did work very well together, even though their matches were kind of cut short because of, um, you know, this match didn't really have the distractions that the WrestleMania Nine match had. So I, I think you could say it's their best match ever. Uh, next up, we have Bret Hart and British Bulldog taking on Owen Hart and Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Obviously, you know, you get all the guys in the Hart Foundation in a nice old school tag match. You know, nothing but good stuff there. Bret Hart versus Hakushi. Uh, everyone was kind of hesitant about Hakushi. No one really wanted to sign him, but Brett really pushed for Vince to sign Hakushi because he's one of the few guys from Japan that really impressed him. So, yeah, him and Hakushi just had a lot of uh, innovative matches. They, they tried a lot of different things here, a lot of uh, high-flying stuff. Even from Brett, Brett busted out some cool stuff here. So him and Hakushi had great chemistry. Not as good as their in-your-house match, but still a really, really good Raw match. And then we have Bret Hart versus Vader. Brett said he hated working with Vader because Vader was just way too stiff. And um, Vader tried as hard as he could to, you know, be be gentle with Brett. But it, when they got backstage, Brett was like, oh, man, you almost killed me. And then Vader started crying and started, you know, throwing stuff because he just felt bad. He, he just felt bad because he was just way too stiff. So that was Vader. So that was uh, the Vader match. Uh, that's pretty much it, you know. Like I said, guys, with a lot of these matches, they, they have kind of weird finishes. They're very special to Brett for his personal taste, but I just wouldn't expect, you know, you know, Bret Hart's greatest matches on here. A lot of those matches have already been released, but uh, if you're a huge Bret Hart fan, you just get a lot of great stuff in here. It's a, it's a great experience, so uh, definitely check it out. Hope you guys enjoy the video, and uh, take it easy.